Hello from the Center for the Political Future at the University of Southern California. My name is Kami Akavan, and I'm the Executive Director. At the Center for the Political Future, our mission is to combine rigorous intellectual inquiry, teaching, and practical politics to advance civil dialogue and research that transcends partisan divisions and finds solutions to pressing national and global challenges. Our events, our programs, our scholarships, our internships, they inspire and train students for careers in public service and lifetimes of civic engagement. To serve that mission and to celebrate Women's History Month this March, we are honored to bring you today's event with two amazing champions for women's rights. Senator Barbara Boxer has been introduced by many people, but not yet by me until today. It is with great pleasure that I present former California Senator Barbara Boxer. She served for 24 years in the US Senate where she chaired the Environment and Public Works Committee and helped pass historic legislation, including the Violence Against Women Act. She also served 10 years in the US House of Representatives and was a supervisor for Marin County. In addition to her storied career in politics, Senator Boxer is also an author and we're honored to have been able to call her a fellow at the USC Center for the Political Future. Welcome back, Senator Boxer. Thank you. I'm also honored to introduce a fellow Iranian American and one of the most recognized women's rights activists in the world, Massey Alinejad. Ms. Alinejad is a journalist and producer for Voice of America. Her social media following is larger than many major news outlets. As many of you know, she is an outspoken critic of the government of the Islamic Republic of Iran and its unfair and unequal treatment of women. Because of her huge influence and strong criticisms, Massey has been targeted by the government and now lives in exile in the United States to protect her safety. Her book, The Wind in My Hair, and the documentary that many of you have seen, Be My Voice, they detail her ongoing and world famous fight to protect women's rights in Iran. Massey, thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure for me. Thank you. Now, Senator Boxer and Ms. Alina Jad will speak together for about 30 minutes or so, and then they will take your questions. So please put your respectful and constructive questions in the Q&A. Ms. Alina Jad, Senator Boxer, the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much. I'm, I'm just so pleased uh, to meet you, Massey, and um, saw the film. And uh, clearly you are one of the very few truth tellers uh, when it comes to women's rights in Iran. And as we just saw, it's, it's a nightmare that, that's going on there for those who simply wanna be treated equally. And for those um, men who support women and see it that way as well. Um, I could tell you just from my own experience, um, women voted for me in very large numbers, but I would not have been elected had it not been for men who recognized the fact that we needed more women. So, you know, it needs to be a, a coalescing of fair-minded people. Um, so I've worked with the crew here on, on a, some questions and I just wanted to say, and I know you'll answer anything because I know from the film that you're very outspoken. But if I do ask anything that you find you, you think is off, to please don't worry about it. We'll go to the next question, okay? Don't right. worry, I'm used to it. I'm used to it. <laughs> okay. So my first question is this. Um, I'm old enough to remember that uh, there was a time in Iran when women could ride bicycles and go dancing and study whatever major they wanted at university and leave their heads uncovered and be anyone they wanted to be. Um, now the government says no to these things. If you could give us a historical perspective, was this a quick change? Did this happen slowly? Give us a sense of the history of this. Um, I have to say that the, the revolution itself became a revolution against women. Yeah, it was very quick, right after the revolution. The um, Islamic Republic officials, Ayatollah Khomeini, started to write its own ideology on our bodies. 
basically when you go to my country, Iran, the only way that you understand this is Islamic country is through us because we carry the most visible symbol of, uh, you know, Islamic Republic with us, hijab became compulsory from the beginning. And it, there was a massive protest Iranian women took to the streets. But what, uh, year that? what year was that, Massey? Oh, it was um, 42 years ago. And immediately we lost. I mean, my parents, my parents were part of the revolution. They were, you know, telling me that they were looking for um, a better life. Many reformists that I, I, I met them and I asked them, they were saying that we were looking for political free, um, freedom. But believe me, we didn't gain the political freedom. We lost all the social freedom that we already had. We had so many uh, singers in Iran. We had our own version of Beyonce. All of them left Iran, forced to leave Iran. Um, women are not allowed to ride a bicycle, as you said. Women are not allowed to go to stadium. Women are not allowed to sing, to dance, to show their hair, to be a judge, to be president, to, to, to get a passport without getting permission from their husband. So the revolution became a revolution against humanity. So what I basically hear you saying, and it's, um, it's really interesting, uh, is that by, inf by forcing women to give up so much freedom, by forcing them, by forcing them to wear the head cover, which is of course the focus of the film, it's a, um, it is a signal to the world about this government in Iran. It's a signal to the world about where they've moved. And it's also interesting that I'm assuming your parents didn't think that they would go this far when they took over. Is that correct? I mean, not only my, uh, my parents, now they are actually suffering the, the economic problem because the revolution were like, uh, to my parents, they were actually looking for a better quality life. What happened now, all the workers, like um, the working class, now they joined the Iran protest, as you saw in the film, and they were chanting against the Islamic Republic because it's... Um, to be honest, many, many of those people who were part of the revolution, now they're saying that um, they regret because they see the result. They mm -hmm. see that the mullahs are being, I mean, the, they see the corruption. These mullahs, they, they send their children to the United States of America, but people in Iran are forced to say death to America. This is another thing because I, it's, I, I know my, the focus of the film is about hijab, but I always say that um, the, the Islamic Republic, for its own survival, they have three pillars, death to America, death to Israel, and women's rights. So now we see that the huge hypocrisy. They send their children to live in the U.S. They're all enjoying themselves, freedom of choice. They're all removing their hijab, some of them. But people are getting bitten up, receive like long prison sentence just because of practicing their you know, basic rights inside Iran. Now, when I was in the Senate, I was on the Foreign Relations Committee and um, was stunned at, at the very things you're talking about. I was, I was, uh, I don't know if you've ever met anyone who's had to wear uh, what the Taliban forced you to wear. What do they call that? The burqa? Yes. The burqa? Or according to them, chadori, the women of Afghanistan. Said. Okay, but I call it a burqa. So one of the things that I did is I put the burqa on my and 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 I want to just say to you, um, Massey, the the sense of disappearing from the world when you put that thing on, and you know, I'm sure if they had their way, they they'd love to see the women in Iran doing that. God forbid. But what I'm saying to you, what I want to explore a little bit with you, um, is the psychological impact of covering up who you are. And I thought the film did so well with that because, you know, whether we're gray haired or we're red haired or we're brown haired or we have flowers in our hair, you know, this is something that is so individual. Mm -hmm. uh, and when you force someone to cover up a part of their, their body, and especially of course, the extreme case of the burqa, which you can't even breathe in that thing. To me, what you are saying to people, and I just want to know if you agree with me on this, is you don't exist. Yes. You don't exist. 
And for somebody to tell a human being, and I'm, I'm a very spiritual person, and I believe we're all God's children, and I believe God is good. So I can't imagine how anyone thinks they have the right to make you disappear. So I think the reason I think the film is brilliant um, is because you're looking at this simple head covering and what it represents. So can you expound on that about whether you agree with me on this? I have a hunch you agree with me, but is that the sense you're getting that women in your country are, are figuring this out, that this is meant to make them disappear? Actually, thank you so much for clarifying and make it very clear that you tried this and um, based on your own experience, you feel that you cannot even breathe and it's against your existence. It's against your dignity. It's against your, um, your, your, your identity. Because many people, Senator Baxter, I'm gonna be very clear, here in the West, they don't even allow us to talk about our own experiences. So I'm gonna tell you about my experience. I remember that from the age of seven, when I was forced to wear it, because if you don't wear it, you're not, you, you won't be able to go to school. You won't be able to get an education. So it's when you wear it from the age of seven, it's going to be part of your body. Yeah. And I remember when I left in, when I left my country outside Iran, I was, there was no morality police around. There was no, my parents were not around, but it's still, I was telling everyone that this is my choice. I removed my headscarf with the black hat, my version of hijab. And I used to say everyone that this is my choice. But you know what? I didn't want to break my mother's heart. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to lose my community. I didn't want to break my father's heart. I wanted to go back to Iran and I thought I'm gonna lose my country. So you see social pressure, emotional pressure, many psychological pressure that made me to say that even outside Iran, in the West, that that was my choice. Immediately, when I decided actually to make myself free from uh, you know, all those wrong thoughts, I found that, wow, the government not only took my body hostage, they took my mind hostage. And for me, now I'm not fighting against a small piece of cloth. For me, compulsory hijab is the main pillar of Taliban, ISIS. Islamic Republic. It's the main pillar of a religious dictatorship. You remember when uh, the woman, the Yazidi woman got free from ISIS? What was the first image that came out from them? They were all burning the borgia, the compulsory veiling. That actually shows you that this is a symbol of uh, oppression. So my mom wears hijab, you know? I, I have so much respect for my mother who traditionally wearing compulsory hijab, but I am against political Islam, who forced half of the population in Iran and telling you that you have to carry uh, our symbol of ideology. That is what I am against it. And I have to say that many women in Afghanistan, in Iran, they're not fighting against small piece of cloth or hijab. They want to have dignity and freedom. And we deserve to have. You certainly do. Um, yes, you make a really good point. It should be a choice. I mean, if I want to cover my hair every day because I don't like it or because I feel that it's a religious symbol and I, for me, fine, don't force me to. Give me the choice. And you know, in this country, as you're well aware, we have a pro-choice movement. And- But it's going in a wrong direction. <laughs> yeah, well, of course it is, but that's because certain movements here in this country that are very worrisome. But I wanna talk about what it meant to me because my whole career, it's been a central part of my life because uh, when I started in politics, it was illegal to have an abortion uh, in many, many states. And uh, then Roe v. Wade passed all the way those years ago in the 70s and it became up to the woman. And I, the, the reason I bring up the word choice, I think the word choice is a beautiful word and to me, uh, as a politician and as I took on this issue, very delicate issue of abortion in some religions here, and we have, we have so many different religions, some people would never want their, to have an abortion. And to me, that's fine, it's up to them. 
just don't tell my kid what to do. Don't yeah. tell my constituents what to do. And I think the notion of just saying, if someone wants to uh, wear something, it, let them do it. And if they don't, let them do it. And I think it just takes all the, <laughs> the hostility out of it. Uh, it. Not everyone is the same. This one is gonna be this way, this one's gonna be. And I often said, as I campaigned on the issue of choice, I said, I'm pro-choice. That means if you never wanna have an abortion, I will support you, that's your choice. But I don't want government telling anybody what to do. I say, it's a personal issue. And when it comes to the way I look, the way I dress and my medical choices, I don't wanna call the president. I don't care who it is. I don't wanna call my Senator or you know the Ayatollah, or whoever. It's just you know, let them deal with their own families. Good mm -hmm. luck. That's fine. Deal with your own children, but leave people alone. Mm -hmm. And it does come down to a word you used so beautifully earlier, which is the word respect. I mean, how could we say we respect women? Last point I make and ask you to comment on is this: um, if you look at all of the countries of the world and see which one of them, which countries are doing the best, which gets you down to your family, why they supported the revolution, they thought they could do better economically, et cetera. What you find is the less freedom women have in countries, the worse the economy is. Why is that? Because brilliant people like you, if I might say, who would give so much back if you had freedom, um, if you're forced to wear things and not go to school and not get your degree, you're not giving anything to the economy, to the society. If women can't drive, for goodness sakes, they can't get to a certain place of work, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, I would like you to respond. I think it you're fighting for, for the rights of women to be who they are. And to, but, but won't it benefit the country Exactly. And I think if you talk about that, that might be an interesting way for you to go. Exactly. Look, um, right now, half of the population uh, are banned from their basic rights. But 60% of women occupied at the universities. That shows how smart they are. And it's, there's a huge gap between the, 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 the women, the young generation, and the mullahs who are making decisions over our own body. These women... You don't see them on like, uh, we don't have female ministers. We don't have female judges. And forget about that. Women who occupied at 60% of university places, but they cannot make decision over their own body. That's stupid. And what yeah. actually I wanna make it clear here, when um, I see the women's rights movement in, in America, um, I have to say that mostly the Islamic Republic and Taliban what what helped them to survive? It's the Western government. It's uh, the, the the Western government actually um, legitimizing them. I'm going to give you an example. Right now, uh, women of Afghanistan, women of Iran, they are actually fighting for their basic rights. They go to prison. They risk their lives, and they say that one of the slogan is "My body, my choice." But when it comes to America, my body, my choice is very important. Nobody says this is a small issue. When it comes to women of Iran and Afghanistan, I see all the Western feminists, all the Western politicians. They wore hijab in front of Taliban, in front of the Islamic Republic officials. And they say that, oh, this is your culture. Mm. This is an insult to the women of Iran and Afghanistan. When we see that the feminist movement, Western feminist movement, go in a wrong direction. And even more than this, in America, you know, I have, um, with all respect, Ilhan Omar created a law uh, trying to actually fight back any criticism in the name of, as she says, Islamophobia. Look, in my country, women get lashes if they remove their hijab. Women uh, get kicked out from school from like, girls from the age of seven. Women don't have any basic rights. Men 
women get executed if they criticize Islam, if they criticize Prophet Muhammad. Um, and because of the law, blasphemy laws, people get hanged and executed in Iran and Afghanistan. So outside Iran, if we share these stories, just share these stories, people say, shh, you're causing Islamophobia. Mm. Wait a minute. I ask all those people, would you be happy to go and live under Sharia laws in Iran and Afghanistan? They say no. But when it comes to us, they say that you shouldn't share the story. I, I, let me give you an example. Um, Nadia Murad, who just escaped from ISIS, she was raped. She actually won the Nobel Peace Prize. And um, I have you know, so much admiration for her bravery to, to speak up for the women of, uh, you know, being victim of rape. Her, um, she was actually invited to go to Canada to give a talk, but immediately they canceled her talk, Canadian schools, saying that it might cause Islamophobia. Can you believe that? Mm. In the West, in 20 person, I myself, I was a target of uh, Islamic Republic to be kidnapped. Now I'm an American citizen. The Islamic Republic tried to challenge the U.S. government on U.S. soil. None of the female congresswomen, none of the women's rights organization in America, none of the like female senators condemned that. I reached out to many of them. I'm but shocked. Why? I'm not shocked. So, but all of the, the uh, many of these uh, congresswomen. They celebrated World Hijab Day. Hmm. So for this, I think this is hypocrisy and we have to be all brave and call on them and ask them, if you are a true feminist, doesn't matter if uh, uh, human rights abuse happened in America, in France or in Iran or Afghanistan, we should keep the sisterhood and support each other. Yeah, I'm, I'm myself, very yeah. shocked. I'm very shocked that you didn't get a better response. Uh, for years, uh, we stood with the women uh, of Afghanistan. So I'm very confused on the point, but I think I think what is happening is, it goes back to what I said before about the choice that women oh, should have. Exactly. If they want to do it, fine. Uh, if they don't want to wear it, fine. And so it is tricky. It's tricky. And you have tried to walk that fine line uh, that was one of the questions we had. You, you've always said that your uh, that your activism is against the hardline regime in Iran, not the Islamic religion. And uh, can you explain how you navigate this very tricky situation? Look, it, it's very simple. This is twenty first century, and I am for the separation of religion, politics. That's all. In 21st century, we deserve to have a secular democratic country. And that's why we are fighting. That's why we are actually asking all the feminist global movement that um, support us and be our voice. Because uh, the, the young generation in Iran, they deserve to have a better life. But as far, I mean, as long as we have religion interfering in politics, we're not gonna have freedom and dignity. Well, can I say that's a brilliant answer? I, I want to stop you here because it's, of course, the fundamental uh, basis of our uh, democracy here, which is separation of church and state, as we call it. And I think that is a perfect way to, to handle it, the way you just answered the question. Um, as I said, people have a right to practice whatever religion they want. People have a right to dress. However, they, I don't care how people dress, right? Yeah. But never force someone to dress a certain way. Never force someone to uh, to have to go to church or synagogue or the mosque or wherever. This is up to them. And I think that you have navigated that very, very well to say what you're talking about is making sure that religion is over here and governance is over here and they should be separated and let people make their own their own decisions, but I, I can see your frustration uh, when when Western women put on the hijab. They're they're trying to say, <laughs> I think what you're trying to say, which is we don't wear this every day, but we respect the religion. But I get your point, and I think you make a very strong point 
that I will certainly convey to my uh, former colleagues. Now, the film was made in 2018. I can't believe it's been that long. Yeah. Yes. And, uh, have things gotten worse or better or what's the situation? Oh, Senator Boxer, I have to say that things getting worse and I don't want to even actually, um, I put the blame on myself saying that why I didn't add when the Iranian regime shot down the Ukrainian airplane and killed 176 innocent people. And then they wanted to put the blame on America. I, I was like, I wish I could put this story in the film as well. Mm -hmm. After when the film was uh, like finished, the Iranian regime executed a uh, young and well-known uh, athletes for the crime of protesting. I couldn't add that in the film as well. Mm -hmm. I myself was the target of the Islamic Republic. They were, you know, they hired a private investigator here in Brooklyn to kidnap me. Oh my! This is not in the yeah. This is not in the film, but as long as the Islamic Republic is, exists. The situation is getting worse and worse. Yeah. And as I mentioned uh, before, Iranian people managed actually to risk their life, as you saw in the movie. The mothers of those people who got killed in Iran protests, they're really brave within the society to say no to Islamic Republic. Like, like women of Afghanistan, they took to the street. Right now that we are talking, they're risking their lives. They go to the street and begging the Western government not to legitimize Taliban. Mm. But unfortunately, for years and years, anti-Putin activists saying the same, that do not give a democratic title to Putin because he's a dictator. Yeah. We have been saying this for years and years, that do not call our murderers, like do not see them like a normal uh, regime. Now women of Afghanistan saying the same, do not legitimize Taliban, they are terrorists. But the West actually, when they're legitimizing these dictators, they are actually empowering our oppressors to kill us, to put more pressure on us. Look, right now that I'm talking to you, the US citizen, American, uh, the UK citizen, German citizen, French citizen, Sweden, Swedish citizen, all of them, French citizens, they're being in Iranian prison, They've been like a hostage in the hand of the regime and using them like a bargaining chip to convince the West to have a deal. That's unbelievable. Look, the dictators from Russia to China to Venezuela, to, to, they're all united. They're more united than the democratic countries. My dream is to see that all the democratic countries get united, ask the Islamic regime, release all the innocent hostages right now rather than awarding them when the regime sees that they've been rewarded, then there is no point for them to release innocent dual national citizens to release innocent women. When they see that, the, I mean, I wanna give you an example. I was challenging one of the cleric that why you force women to wear hijab. He told me that, look, even the high representative of the European parliament respect our law. Who are you? How dare you? to misrespect our law. That's the point. When we, the women of Iran and Afghanistan, risk our life and the Western government legitimize our murderer, of course we're not gonna be successful. I hear you. I'm, but but uh, last point, I'm not asking the Western government to come and save us. I just want them not to save Taliban and Islamic Republic. That's I, all. I hear your point. It's very, very, very well taken. And I would love to see, frankly, uh, a meeting uh, with the senators and the congresswomen. Uh, go to the uh, go have a meeting uh, with the leaders of these countries and just say, you know, we we normally would have put the hijab on. We're not doing it in support of the women who just want a choice and want a separation of religion and government. So I, I think that's an excellent point. But what I hear you saying is since the film, things have gotten worse uh, for sure. And I would just say, I mean, I, I've written a few books, I've never made a film, but I think it'd be great if there was some language on the film at the end of the film to bring people up to, because you do show how many years certain people were put in jail and all the rest, that you might just say, you know, where you, that they tried to kidnap you, that you are uh, safely in a, in a safe place and just bringing up to date 
some of that. So before I, I turn it back uh, for more for questions to the audience, I want to say, um, do you feel that this film is making a difference? Do you feel that um, uh, that it's making a difference or has it made life harder for your family and, and some of the others or, or wouldn't it have mattered? That's a very good question because um, to be honest, uh, I just came back from Italy. I'm still jet lag, but I got a lot of good feedback from public opinion from, from ordinary people in seven cities. Um, but all the journalists, they have different views. I'm, I'm being very honest with you. Many journalists saying that, um, you know, you're causing Islamophobia or they saying that uh, you're outside Iran, you shouldn't talk about this. Some of them even put the blame on me saying that, look, Iranian women get arrested. And even more scary than this, um, some of the Western journalists and Western politicians actually saying that, um, you know, because we want to have a deal, let's not talk about now human rights. Let's separate human rights from nuclear deal. But through this movie, a lot of ordinary people, a lot of students, a lot of uh, academic, like many people who are not uh, part of the uh, like, you know, government or media, they get a good, they, they gave me a good feedback. And they're saying that uh, basically we, thought that we wear the hijab out of respect to your culture. And I said, this is an insult calling a barbaric law part of our nation. They were convinced. And many people say that you're causing Islamophobia. I said, this is not me causing Islamophobia. This is all the barbaric laws lashes us, jail us, execute us, causing phobia. But my fear of Islamic laws, my fear of Taliban and ISIS is rational. So they were convinced. And now I, I strongly believe that what is missing here is just sisterhood among global feminist movement, among female politicians. Here, we have the first, you know, this is the first time that we have um, a vice president, female vice president. I mean, I don't think it's too much to, to, to see solidarity when she support World Hijab Day, when all the Congress women, women they support World Hijab Day. I'm wondering how come they never support those women who don't want to be forced to wear hijab in Iran, in Afghanistan, but instead they wore it in front of Taliban and Islamic Republic, many of the Western female politicians. So this is missing. Many politicians try to ignore us. For me, I was the one who joined Women's March in America. None of them supported our cause. I condemn the Muslim ban in America. None of them support, support my cause because I say that we have women ban as well because women are banned from entering Iran or Afghanistan if they don't practice Sharia laws. So why nobody support women? Our, our fight, this hypocrisy, this double standard hurts us. I think this is something that we have to speak up. We have to get together because what happened in Vegas is going to stay in Vegas, but what happened in the Middle East is not going to stay in the Middle East. No, I we have you. to all fight together. Yeah, I think you're making a very good point. Look, I think it gets back to this separation of religion and politics. And I think what's happened here is to show respect for Islam. The women did that, not realizing what you're pointing out. So, you know what I'm saying? And so I think... There needs to be- uh, Senator Baxter, can I interrupt you? Let me, let me these, these politicians- Let sure. me just finish my point. Sure, sure. Because if it were me, and I wanted to show respect for Islam, I would say, you know what? Um, if I was here and I wanted to wear this, because there is prejudice against some women here who do want to wear the hijab, and that's their choice. So we may have a difference of opinion here, but what I'm trying to tell you is what I think is the winning thing I can take out of this is a win-win for you is that what I would do after speaking with you on World Hijab Day is go to do some press conference and say, if I you know, was following Islam and if I believed that wearing the hijab was important, if I was, I should be able to wear it. But guess what? In Iran and in other places, women are forced. I am taking it off. And I am saying it is time 
yes. to separate these two things. And I think that's something that you're teaching Listen. me. I never thought about it. And so I'm so grateful to you, seriously, for, for pointing that out. And I will point it out in my in my talks and when I write and so on. Thank you. But I do have enjoyed uh, the opportunity. I don't want to take any longer because I know there's questions. So I'm going to turn it to to Connie to continue this and I will stay right here watching. Sure, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Really enjoyed it. Kami, are you there? Yes, I sure am. Uh, excellent d discussion. We are so grateful to you both for sharing these uh, terrific insights. We've been getting a lot of questions, which is great. So I'm going to start politely bombarding you with the many questions we have received. Uh, the first question comes from uh, Diana Crispy. She said that the film was really emotionally difficult to watch. Is there something that we can do to make a change? I think there are a lot that we can do to make a change. First of all, I'm sure the, the film was really uh, emotional because you saw a lot of women carrying a lot of pain but at the same time, it was powerful. At the same time, when you see a 20 year old receive, a 20 year old woman receive 24 years prison sentence, I was miserable, crying, didn't know what to do. But immediately, the mother showed me the path by saying that on the video, I am the voice of my daughter from now on. So these are the powerful message of the video. Another thing, when 1,500 people got killed in Iran protests, I'm going to be very, very honest with you. Not only me, many, many Iranians were frustrated, depressed, didn't know what to do because the government shut down the internet for three days and killed 1,500 people, arrested 7,000 people. We didn't know what to do. The mothers, as soon as the internet was on, the mother showed us the path. They were holding a picture of their beloved one, walking to the same streets and saying that my son, my daughter got killed here. Now I am his voice, I am her voice, and I want you to be my voice. For me, women of the Middle East, yes, we learn how to be powerful through our pain. Um, I always, I mean, every morning when I wake up, as you see, I carry a lot of uh, burden on my shoulder. Every, say, every day I tell to myself that the government did everything even to break myself. They, they interrogated my 70-year-old mother. They put my brother in jail for two years. They brought my sister on TV to disown me publicly. I was watching my sister, like 17 minutes is a lot on TV, that she was disowning me. They uh, threatened me to, like death threat, throwing acid on my face in Brooklyn, um, sending someone here to kidnap me. I mean, there are a lot. I, lo I love my husband, but even for, for him, it was not easy for his children. But at the end of the day, look, I'm only 45 kilos, but they sent someone here to kidnap me. It means that they're scared of me. They're scared of millions of other women like me. So this is powerful. It's not just pain or miserable. I have two options, to feel miserable every day or to make my oppressors feel miserable. I choose second one. And I want you to choose second one and be our voice. You can do a lot. Ask the tech companies to kick out the dictators while the dictators ban the Iranian people from entering social media, from entering Twitter, from having Facebook, Instagram. So you can actually write to the tech companies that kick the dictators out until the day that Iranian people are allowed to use social media freely. Uh, to that point, we have a, a related question. This one comes from Mina. She says, the title of your film is Be My Voice. Did you want to be the voice for so many women? Yes, actually, I'm going to let you know that this is a... This is a request and demand from Puya Bakhtiari's mother. Puya was a beautiful human being. Puya, is a, Puya was using his own camera in Iran protest, full of joy, asking 
Iranians to take to the street and join him while he was in the protest. Didn't know that he's going to get shot in the head. So his voice is a symbol for all Iranians saying that, join us, join us. I'm in the street. I am the son of somebody. I am the you know, son, of, son of my father. So join me. My mother is with me. He got shot in the head in front of his mother. He got killed in front of his mother. So his mother took his camera and now his mother became his voice. And she told me in the movie, Massey, be my voice. So I choose the title of the movie. I mean, actually not me, the director, Nahid Person. She chose uh, this because Puyo's mother asked me to be her voice. And I want to actually tell you that Nahid Person, the director of the movie, her brother herself got executed when he was only 17 years old. Rostam was 17 years old. Now he decided to be the voice of uh, his bro her brother by actually making a documentary about other Iranians who are suffering, but who, at the same time, they are brave to speak up. So basically when the title is Be My Voice, it means that you even can be the voice of every individual person that you saw in the movie. Masume, Sabo, Yasaman, Puyo, Pejman, Farzad. I feel very bad when I don't name them, name them because to me, it's, they're not a statistic, you know? In America, people are like, say her name, say his name. This is, it's like my heart. I want to name them all. So be their voices. Thank you for that response. Uh, this next question is from an anonymous attendee and it's more of a political question. It asks, do you support a renegotiation of a nuclear agreement between the United States and Iran? I'm gonna actually answer this question by asking you, if a regime take your whole family hostage, if a regime took all the dual national citizens hostage, if a regime kills innocent protesters, 1,500 protesters in three days, if a regime put a 20-year-old woman in prison and for 24 years just because of removing her hijab, would you just go and have negotiation about nuclear deal or you put human rights first? Then this is my answer. I actually asked President Biden the same question. When I was myself the target of kidnapping plot, President Biden was quiet. And I asked the same question that if it was not me, if it was your relative, your son, your daughter, would you just go after the Islamic Republic and say, yeah, let's talk about nuclear deal? Or you would ask immediately, release my son, release my daughter. This is what we want. Now, a lot of dual national citizens are looking to the US government to ask its own allies in Europe. First, release even the European citizens, release the innocent American citizens, release the innocent political prisoners, release the innocent women who are in prison. The mothers and father of those people who got killed, they are in prison right now. Just because of asking, why did you kill my son? Why did you kill my daughter? So the American government, the European government, they should stick together and stand up for universal value. Human rights should not be buried under nuclear deal, especially right now when the foreign minister of Russia pushing to get the deal. If I could just say, you know, in America, we have the expression walk and chew gum at the same time. I'm sure you know it. We have to do that all. We have to do all of it. It's so both things are life and death things, both things. One, the human rights is obviously we know life and death for so many. And two, if Iran gets a nuclear weapon, uh, it, let me just say the world would not be a safe, a safer place. And so it's we see what Putin is doing and getting away with because he has nuclear weapons. It's very complex. I think the way you answered it was right. I think we cannot forget, we have to put it all on the table. It's very delicate. 
and it has to be put on the table. Yeah, the problem is here that because of the deal, they try to compromise with the, with the murderers and they bury human rights. Otherwise, I think they would have been loud and clear to condemn human rights abuse. I mean, I'm being very honest with you. What happened to me, um, Biden administration didn't want to even release the news of my kidnapping plot. I was told by the FBI that they put a lot of pressure on pressure to Biden administration to release the news. They thought that it, it, it was going to ruin the talk between the US government and Iranian regime. So you see, this is the, I mean, taking hostage, murdering, killing is in the DNA of the Islamic Republic. If you don't punish them, if you just reward them, there is no point for the Islamic Republic to stop. Uh, such good points. This next question comes from Jale. I think there's some Iranian Americans watching today. Uh, and her question is more uh, about your path uh, for you, Massey. This is about uh, that she said that you grew up in a small village in Iran. How did you get from that small village to become a world famous journalist and activist? I started my own revolution from my family's kitchen, <laughs> as uh, I always say. Um, actually, in our village, uh, we had a black and white TV. And um, I remember through that black and white TV, I was always watching the mullahs, the clerics, talking against me and millions of other women, saying that you have to follow this, you have to do that, you have to follow Sharia laws. If not, we're going to hang you with your hair. So, but now the clerics are watching me and they all know me by my name. They have different names for me, for sure. They call me the agent of MI6, the agent of CIA, the agent of Mossad. They even call me Ugly Duckling. They don't know even the end of the story of Ugly Duckling. But the thing is, I strongly believe that I, uh, I, 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 I had no, I mean, my mother told me that, um, if you see the darkness, you have to open your eyes as wide as you could. Then you're going to defeat the darkness. And as a woman who grew up in a small village to a traditional family, I experienced, you know, poverty. I experienced war. I experienced revolution. I experienced discrimination. I had to make a decision to be a victim or to be a warrior. I learned from my mother, who is even not able to read and write to be a warrior instead of waiting for someone to come and save me to be a savior. Yeah, this is my path. I made a decision and I think many women who are watching me now, they, uh, you know, they, in Iran, they're doing the same. My heroes, my, my the, like these women that you see in the movie, they're like Rosa Parks of Iran. They are the same. So they, they had to fight back every single right they have. <laughs> This next question reminds me of filling up my gas tank this morning. It cost me $80 to fill up my Toyota. And the question is from Amira Mansour. And Amira asks, do you think we should be speaking to Iran and Venezuela about oil due to the ban on Russian oil? It seems that oil has been at the root of so many wars. To me, Amira, we shouldn't negotiate with any dictators, but maybe speaking to them is better than not speaking to them. What do you think? Um, as I said, that speaking with dictators is different than legitimizing the dictators. You know, let me just actually refer to Gary Kasparov, the legend, the chess champion. He actually, the, the Russian chess champion, um, the world chess champion, he wrote a book in 2014. The title of the book was Winter is Coming. And as he says that words have power, we should not give um, democratic title to dictators. He was fighting for years and years to actually ask the West to isolate Putin. But not by not isolating Putin, what happened? The war is here in Europe. So for me, I don't see there, there's, a, I mean, there's nothing wrong to do with uh, negotiating with the dictators about human rights, about like, the basic human rights or condemning the dictators on, on their 
what they're doing to their own people. But I want to just give you an example. Right now, many Western governments in Norway, everywhere, they go and they talk to Taliban. Honestly, is it negotiation or legitimizing when you, the first step is you obey compulsory job in front of Taliban in Norway. And uh, Senator Boxer, you actually mentioned that because many Western politicians, they wear it because they want to respect Islam. The, 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 the US uh, female politician, the envoy of Afghanistan, she went to Norway to meet the Taliban. The first thing that she did, she wore her job. This is not respecting Islam. This is respecting Taliban. This yeah. is not calling, this is not negotiation. This is legitimizing Taliban. The same, it's about dictators. And I just want to finish this with what I said before. From China to Russia, from Venezuela to Islamic Republic, Taliban. I mean, around to Zimbabwe, around the world, dictators are more united than us freedom fighters. This is something that's missing here. If we stand uh, for our values, dictators are going to fail. But I see that here, American government, they rather go and negotiate with Islamic Republic, but they don't want to even negotiate with us, with civil society. If really the world is looking for stability, they cannot just go and have negotiate with one of the most unstable regime, like Islamic Republic or Taliban. They have to recognize the civil society. And another thing, which I, I really want to use the opportunity to say, why my, I mean, because I'm shocked. I'm fighting for freedom of choice. Why only uh, like a, a lot of left and liberal abandon us and saying that your cause is just supported by right wing or by Trump administration or Israeli government. If I'm doing the right thing, then you join us. You join us. Look, I'm saying that we are looking for freedom of choice, dignity, separation of religion and politics. This is the right thing. You say my body, my choice. We say my body, my choice in Iran and Afghanistan as well. You say we have to be feminist. The true feminist is like in, in the, the true feminists are in Iran and Afghanistan. In, they're facing bullets, lashes, prison, but they say we want um, equality. So these are our same slogan, same goal. Why you leave us alone? For years and years, we say that isolate Taliban, isolate Islamic Republic, but you isolate us. We are not your enemy. You should be our allies. I love America. I came here to have freedom of choice. Why you say, shh, your story causes Islamophobia? Why you don't understand that my fear of Islamic laws is rational? Let us talk. If you don't let us talk, that doesn't mean we're going to stop. But if you join us, we're going to be more stronger. I mean, together, we are stronger against dictators. Hey, Comey, I just feel I have to say, Comey, um, I don't think it's uh, particularly fair to say that feminists are not supporting uh, your cause. I, I just don't even find that absolutely, I don't find truth in it. I, I, what, I, what I think is that the people of the far right who believe in you know, strict religion and don't respect the difference between uh, church and state, I mean, basically, they're, I think they're the ones. And I just want to make a point. I mean, the fact that some of these women are make, wearing this hijab, they don't do it because they're against feminism. They are confused about it, and you're straightening them out. So I don't want you to uh, think that the women are against you. I, I think it's quite the opposite. I think uh, I can't imagine one women's rights group or one, one pro-choice woman in my in, in my party, frankly, and in the other party too, the pro-choice women who wouldn't support you. I just think there's a miscommunication, not with Maybe. you. It's not your fault. You, it's not your thing. I think that it's, it's on us. We have to understand what we're doing better. And I think what you've done today in explaining, expressing this so eloquently is very, very helpful. I don't want you to feel, because I sense in your voice kind of an anger toward the feminist movement here and thinking that they're not with you. 
I, I just think that's just not true. And it's these issues are very layered and complex because what I'm trying to say to you is people want to support the 100% right of a woman to do what she wants when she wants to, uh, as long as she's just following her freedoms and what her beliefs are, at the same time have the right to do if she does want to follow a different course. And it's, it's not the easiest messaging, but I think you have taught me a lot today. But I don't want you to harbor a grievance against feminism in America, because I, honest to God, don't think they've abandoned you. I don't. Thank you so much. That's all we need to hear, which is, as I said, to look, this is my mother. I mean, actually, you saw my mother, but everywhere when I go, when I talk about Islamic laws, I put this in front of me because I want to actually tell the rest of the world that my dream is to walk shoulder to shoulder with yeah. my beautiful mother. But I mean, maybe my, I, I get angry because I see that here for women. Uh, just recently, there was a World Hijab Day. Many Congresswomen, they wore hijab, but we call on them to say that there are five women, young women are in prison, support them, they didn't. And maybe because I'm angry because when I see that female politicians wearing hijab in front of Taliban, that makes me maybe no, no, more I, angry. No, I totally hear you. And I think there is confusion and it needs to be uh, resolved. And I, you know, I'm, I'm very grateful that I had the opportunity to meet you today uh, to see the film, to understand uh, that maybe there are some messages that are going out that are not meant to hurt the feminists, but obviously are uh, hurting the feminists in, uh, in these countries. So I, it's extremely, for me, it's been enlightening and I'm sure for a lot of people on the call. I appreciate that, thank you. That means a lot to me because as I said, I don't wanna be just supported by just right wing. This is a universal values and all, because look, if Taliban or Islamic Republic or terrorist attack happen, they're not gonna ask for your political view. They're not gonna ask whether you're right wing, left wing, liberal. No, they attack all of us and we should be together. But don't get mixed up with the right wing. They, the right wing wouldn't even let you have reproductive rights. So forget it. I mean, that the far right isn't, they're not supporting it. What they want is they don't, they, they don't want any progress on the nuclear deal. It's getting swept up into your issue. And I just think that's a big mistake. Me, uh, my own opinion is, I hear your point. You have to put it all on the table. But I wouldn't mix up the nuclear deal with the rights of women. Honest to God, I think it's it's complex and it, they're not directly tied together, except that the people who are making the decisions in Iran are the people that are making horrible decisions about women. But I would be cautious on the point. Don't, don't, you shouldn't be, <laughs> you shouldn't make a deal with right wing or left wing. You should be, you should be reaching out to the whole group. I, I did. And I, I strongly believe we all should do that. Look, I met with Secretary Blinken. I met with Secretary Pompeo. I met with Secretary Hillary Clinton because when it comes to human rights, I have to make it clear to all politicians around the world that you could not bury human rights under the deal. At, I, at the same time, when I met with uh, uh, Trump's administration, I told them that Iranian people want freedom and dignity, but we, should, we don't want to see you have a deal with Islamic Republic and bury human rights. I said the same to Secretary Blinken. I met with Jake Sullivan and I said the same, but what we see here I mean, we, can, we cannot ignore this. What we see here, because of the deal, many politicians try to ignore human rights. Oh, yeah. That's concern, and they, yeah. So I agree with you that that's wrong, but you also don't wanna be used by people who don't wanna deal. And then they say, we hate the government because they make people wear hijab. They don't literally care about that, in my opinion. I'm being, you're being honest, I'm being honest. I don't want you to be used by anyone. I don't want you. I'm, to I'm, I have agency. I'm not going to allow anyone to use me. No, no the, I don't want you used by right wing, left wing, middle wing, any no. wing. Your, Thank you so much. Your issue is so clear. Yeah. Women need their freedom, their rights, their equality. They shouldn't be forced to wear anything. They shouldn't be forced not to wear anything. And I think that issue is so powerful. And as we discussed in the first part of this, 
if you weave, if you just take that issue as it stands, it is so powerful and it is so wrong what they're doing and it's hurting their economy and it's hurting individuals. And it's, it's, and your most powerful point I thought is they're using women there to show how powerful they are and how totalitarian they are. And I think if you get it mixed up with this nuclear thing, look, it's up to you, you do whatever you want. But my own <laughs> advice as someone who's been around a long time is, You've got the issue that should galvanize everybody and don't get wrapped up in other stuff because my own opinion is you've got the issue that's as clear as a bell. And I would love to see you just stick to it. And I think all of us who are listening and who have seen this film, we should make sure it can be seen more in, in, in America. I hope, will Netflix pick it up? Has it been picked up uh, for streaming? Not, not yet, but we hope uh, we're gonna make it. Because I think so, and I do think another wonderful thing is if that's true, you can bring it a little bit up to date with some words on the screen so people know things are getting even worse. And, uh, and, and also my other advice on it is call them to, give them a phone number they can call, give them an organization they can write to, you know what I mean? To get, because you want, because everybody who's asked you questions, um, the students and the people on have asked what they can do, so. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. We, we are at the top of the hour here and we appreciate your time very, very much. The film is Be My Voice. Our panelists today were Massey Alina Jod, Senator Barbara Boxer. We're so grateful for your time and for allowing the Center for the Political Future to join in commemorating Women's History Month and elevating these issues as high as we can elevate them. Appreciate your time very much. We encourage all of our listeners and viewers to subscribe to our newsletters, follow us on social media. We have events like this on an ongoing basis. We encourage all of you to enjoy and participate. To our panelists, thank you again so much. We appreciate you. Have a wonderful rest of your week, folks. I really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you so much.